Welcome to the Access. I'm your host, Havi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing Turkish American relations, Turkey's position on Syria and Iran, and the Turkish European relationships. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Rajib Suelo, Washington correspondent for the Turkish newspaper Daily Sabah. Thank you so much, Rajib, for joining us today. Thank you. I want to start by talking about all of these, you know, issues that are happening lately uh, in the relationship between the United States and Turkey. We see a lot of fluctuation in the relationship. Um, why are we seeing this, in your opinion? I want to hear the Turkish point of view about this. I mean, it starts with the President Barack Obama. You know, it's mostly Obama's legacy, especially in terms of Syria. As you know, um, Obama administration had a lot of disagreements with uh, Turkish officials about Assad regime's fate. And also there was this um, business with YPG, which is a uh, terror group, PKK's, you know, Syrian um, armed, armed group. And um, even though United States um, State Department designated PKK as a terror group, somehow Obama administration decided not to recognize YPG as a terror group, even though multiple um, websites and multiple U.S. security agencies designated YPG as part of PKK, they just somehow decided not to play along with these designations because they just needed them. They just didn't want to deploy American soldiers on ground. And they just thought, you know, YPG is a good good uh, call for them because, you know, they were effective. They had like a hierarchy, which is, you know, a communist hierarchy, which is a very totalitarian. They control everything. But in the same time, because of they had this strong hierarchy, they were able to be very effective against uh, uh, Daesh. Mm -hmm. And I think that basically never made Turkish officials happy about their cooperation with the United States against Daesh either, mm -hmm. because they were all the time, you know, feeling heartfelt, like, oh, at the end of the day, you know, these people will be emboldened by the American administration. They will, they will feel very powerful, and it will have repercussions in Turkey as well, because. As you know, PKK is actually uh, mainly operating in, in southern Turkey. And there was this uh, peace process with PKK, which was called us because of this uh, United States and uh, YPG issue. And then there are other, you know, topics that have been uh, also a matter of discussion between two countries, which is uh, Pastor under Brunson's arrest. Uh, he has been arrested. Uh, he was arrested in 2016, uh, November, after the um, uh, failed coup in that year. And it wasn't a very hot topic until uh, Trump uh, assumed the office in, in 2017. But when he had his first meeting with President Tayyip Erdogan in May, uh, one of the topics, one of the specific demands uh, raised by Trump administration and Trump himself was passed around under Brunson's release. And mm -hmm. for Turkish officials, um, he was just a person arrested by the Turkish authorities and as uh, soon as um, actually Turkish foreign minister the other day said they didn't know that this was this guy was arrested until a uh, US consulate came to them for help to see this guy because they use citizens so Turkish yes. officials say just he just arrested through normal regular uh, judicial process and they have nothing to do it and he's not a uh, hostage so I even though I didn't want to actually like go to this point as of yet, but since you've mentioned it, what is the story behind Pastor Robinson's arrest and why are we seeing um, this continuation of this case? Is it because he was uh, basically telling uh, or trying to uh, convert people to become Christians? I think that wasn't the issue because he has been doing that for the last 20, 25 years in Turkey. He was mm -hmm. trying to convert people and had any problem. and. Since 2002, Erdogan, some, you know, in one way or another, he was the prime minister, he was not, mm -hmm. he's not president, so he's been in, in government for many mm -hmm. years, and this guy was openly and clearly, uh, you mm -hmm. know, doing whatever he wanted to do. So I think that wasn't the case. You know, after the coup attempt in Turkey, there were a lot of uh, suspicion and also a lot of trauma uh, among uh, Turkish people. That a lot of people start to see a lot of things differently. And um, as far as I understand from the indictment, his personal translator, uh, went to police and reported him as someone who was, you know, involved with uh, PKK or pro-PKK groups mm -hmm. uh, during his uh, travel to southern Turkey uh, in 2014 when, you know, a Kobane battle was happening mm -hmm. between uh, YPG and also um, Daesh. Uh, and also, you know, um, I don't know if you're 
uh, viewers are familiar with uh, the guy called uh, Fethullah Gülen. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this guy has a, a so-called so religious group and had a huge following uh, within the Turkish uh, government agencies and and Turkish people majority and the Turkish government believe he is the uh, mastermind behind the failed coup in Turkey. So. In, in Izmir, where the pastor uh, lives, uh, there are some sort of uh, phone records and other uh, support, supporting evidence that he was involved with this uh, group as well. Mm -hmm. Not maybe directly, maybe indirectly, but there were that's like... That's old Pastor Bronson. Yeah, that's old Pastor Bronson's, uh, you know, involvement. So, Golan, PKK, I mean, everything. Basically. Yeah, basically. So these are the uh, main uh, charges against him. Like this is why this is why they call it like a, you know he is somehow maybe allegedly involved with uh, you know uh, terror mm -hmm. groups because also Gulen's group declared as a terror group in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with the Christianization. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the fact that he's uh, evangelical. Mm -hmm. He's trying to uh, you know say uh, he was trying to singing the gospel of Jesus Christ as uh, Vice President Biden because mm -hmm. I think. Um, Trump administration is trying to use this as a kind of a midterm uh, card for his, you know, electorate. That's mm -hmm. the, one of the main reasons, at least, Turkish officials believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is this specific case, um, but in general, I mean, the United States relationship with Turkey has been one of the most cherished and important alliances mm -hmm. between the United States and, and other uh, countries, especially where there's the NATO uh, factor into all of this. And even in the last NATO summit, we saw that President Trump was very friendly towards President mm -hmm. Erdogan uh, of Turkey. And uh, we saw obviously that, that complete collapse right mm -hmm. after that. But how does Turkey view its relationship to the United States and obviously with the NATO? I mean, um, it's a very complicated situation right now because, you know, if you look at the bilateral ties in institutional uh, view or um, you would just see that, you know, everything just goes normal. You know, Turkey's member NATO, United States, you know, has been using these bases in, in Turkey, still use and uh, uses and um, it seems there is no problem. But there are these things that happening in, in Syria that basically uh, struck a chord in, uh, in Turkish administration that they cannot unite the states completely and they just started to look for other uh, theories that can be true about the United States intention. So a lot of things are coming out of this crisis is about mistrust. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, after the coup, immediately after the coup, the U.S. official statements from uh, John Kerry and the White House, they were like trying to second guess themselves. They weren't like outright condemning the coup and supporting the government. But if you just look at uh, John uh, Kerry's statement, he was just basically, you know, implying that if the coup plotters, you know, uh, came victorious, they would have had maybe a different position. Maybe mm -hmm. they wouldn't, they would just, maybe they would have uh, condemned the coup, but at least they would just they would have looked for ways to cooperate with them. So mm -hmm. it didn't go well with the Turkish administration. And because of this huge elephant in the room, YPG issue, uh, Turkey started to look for other partners in the region. And, mm -hmm. and Russia was one of them because they needed to do something about YPG in Syria because all those talks, all those uh, attempts to convince American officials about YPG were useless. So they mm -hmm. just needed to use a, some sort of hard power to convince the American administration that they have other alternatives and they can play their own game in Syria. And with, uh, with the uh, cooperation with Russia, they were able to, you know, uh, make these operations in northern Syria, like, you know, again, in, in Afrin against YPG and also northern Syria against Daesh. And they also uh, use leverage these uh, operations to support the Free, the free Syrian Army. Mm -hmm. So for Turkey, it was just a very logical uh, thing. So this creates this, this problem with the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and a lot of people in Pentagon perceive Turkey as like a jihadi supporter, mm -hmm. you know, like especially in uh, Special Forces Command, mm -hmm. and especially CENTCOM. So there is this military side of the issues. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the executive office, the White House itself, when Trump came to office, he was very open and he wanted to work with Erdogan. And as you suggested, it was going very well. But um, th there has been this, this agreement, uh, last minute disagreement between Turkey and the United States about a deal on Pastor Brunson. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a lot of misunderstanding also involved in that, uh, in that matter as well.
And so, so where are we today in terms of, so let me actually be frank with you also, because I've heard in Washington that maybe uh, that Turkey is basically hoping to have Fatala Golan as an exchange for Pastor Bronson. Mm -hmm. Is that a deal that Turkey is actually hoping for at this point? Last year, um, Erdogan publicly said that if the United States administration want to have Pastor Bronson, they need to return Fethullah Gülen. Actually, he said that publicly. Mm -hmm. But he didn't follow up that commentary mm -hmm. and with the official channels and the Turkish officials I spoke and the American officials, they say mm -hmm. that Turkey never raised it again. So I think that was like maybe initial idea that, mm -hmm. you know, Erdogan had had. But mm -hmm. later uh, they, they changed their uh, view on this. And um, there, there has been um, extensive uh, talk and talks about this matter for the last two to three months. And as of... Uh, Maybe as of uh, early August, uh, both sides believed that they had a deal. And, mm -hmm. and, and the deal included, um, even though both sides wouldn't you know, acknowledge a deal on the record, but as far as I can understand from Turkish officials, also American officials, and also reporting on the American, American media, uh, you, you see that there was a solid deal. In mm -hmm. return of Pastor Brunson's uh, um, freedom, um, mm -hmm. And also, uh, you know, there are other things that American officials also uh, and Turkish officials also were discussing about a, a guy called Mehmet Akanatilla, who is serving his uh, sentence in, in New York. He was a former Hawk Bank executive, which is a state bank. Mm -hmm. And the guy was uh, uh, actually he stood a trial for violating Iran Iranian sanctions. Yes. Yeah. So in return of Brunson, uh, Turkish officials uh, wanted to have Mehmet Hakan Attila serve his sentence uh, in, in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, Turkish officials also demanded that, you know, there is a treasury side of the business that the uh, treasury wouldn't uh, issue a huge fine against Halk Bank for its uh, alleged violations of sanctions. And, um, and the Americans in return also asked for Turkey to release other uh, American uh, citizens because there is not only Pastor Brunson, there are uh, at least 12 uh, Turkish American uh, citizens, and also there are like three uh, U.S. staff members of um, uh, Turkish citizens, but they're U.S. staff members of uh, U.S. diplomatic missions uh, in uh, in Turkey. So there was like a solid deal with a lot of you know uh, different factors, and there uh, disagreement over why this deal collapsed. Uh, if you ask the American officials, they would just say that. Uh, they asked us to broker release of another Turkish citizen who was uh, staying in house arrest in Israel on terrorism charges. Her name is Erbe Oskan. And, and Trump called Israelis and freed her. And then Turks needed to release Pastor Brunson uh, mm -hmm. in the same day that he stood a trial. But that didn't happen. So Americans and Trump himself also were, uh, were very frustrated. And they just said, okay, if Turks don't hold up their words maybe we just use we just need to use the you know a stick and we just need to go after them with the sanctions and if you ask the turkish officials they would just tell you that you know the process was going fine they would eventually release pastor branson and there was a roadmap but somehow vice president mike pence who is an also evangelical convinced trump that you know turks are very slow maybe they're not going to hold up the agreement we shouldn't wait and we should just, you know, punish them and we should just use these sanctions and also use this as an evangelical card mm -hmm. uh, for uh, their own Republican Party in the midterm elections. Because, you know, if you look at the uh, polls and data from 2016 elections, evangelical vote was very important for Trump's uh, victory in the elections. Mm -hmm. So that's the Turkish side's agreement. And there is also another view that this whole issue about Ebru Oskan, the Turkish citizen who released in Israel thanks to Trump's help, mm -hmm. uh, it was a misunderstanding between Erdogan and Trump, if you ask why, as you suggested when they, you know, um, having this friendly talk growing out in, at NATO summit, they discussed about Ebru Oskan. And when they were discussing, there was only one interpreter and they were just walking around and standing. There was nothing written down. Mm -hmm. Both of them uh, don't speak. So let me just clarify yeah. this. President Trump understood that if they let go of the prisoner in Israel, that was under house arrest in Israel, mm -hmm. Ebru Oskan, that the Turkish government is going to release Pastor Bronson, yeah. which didn't happen, and that made President Trump unhappy. 
Yes. Basically. But there was a larger deal, and Ebru Özkan was just one part of it. Okay. But for Trump, after Ebru Özkan's release, the, the, the agreement needed to be initiated. So because mm -hmm. there are several steps. Mm -hmm. and, and if you talk with the Turkish officials, they say that this was a misunderstanding because that agreement was brokered by Trump and Erdogan at NATO summit and they had nothing written. Mm -hmm. they were, it was just spoken verbal and they don't speak the, each other's language and mm -hmm. there was just only one interpreter. Mm -hmm. And there was also another channel which was doing the main specific agreement, which is Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu and the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know that they also had this kind of agreement. Exactly. Okay. So, so that kind of brings, sheds some light on, on the source of this issue here. Um, since you talked about the YPG and, uh, you know, the pivoting of Turkey towards Russia, um, a lot of people comment about this and say, well, Russia has its own ties to the PKK and the YPG. Mm -hmm. So, you know, isn't that, and, and I mean, you, you know, Turkey is really not basically achieving anything by pivoting towards other countries who have strong ties with these groups, and that includes Iran. So what is the intention and the, basically the purpose of Turkey by making these new bets? I mean, this is a very pragmatist and uh, opportunist take uh, foreign policy making. You know, Turkey didn't have any other leverage to use against the United States to basically provide the bloodline to opposition for the Syrian army, which the United States had no intention to support after they started to partner with YPG. And there are like multifaceted issue. Uh, there were there were uh, multifaceted issues were going on at the time, and of course uh, Turkey was aware of the fact that uh, Russia allowed YPG to open an office in Moscow, and they were also aware of the fact that Russia used to support YPG in Syria, but um, both sides knowing each each other's uh, intentions and their past came came together. And they decided to operate in a very narrow understanding. So the narrow understanding is, we are, it's very clear that Assad regime is not going anywhere. It's very clear that the opposition is not going anywhere. It's very clear that YPG is going to you know, defeat uh, Daesh and Turkey is going to also do something about it. So let's cut a deal and try to work this out. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the relationship with Russia and Turkey is not institutional. It's not part of an alliance. It's just temporary, maybe uh, maybe longer than intended uh, mm -hmm. partnership, but it's not like something that Turkey considers as, as like a vital for its uh, security structure and alliance. It's not it's not like NATO. It's not like any other military alliances Turkey had. It's just mm -hmm. a temporary partnership. And again, if you just look at the issue, if Turkey didn't uh, work with Russia, there wouldn't be any Turkish planes operating in Syria because Russians would taken would have taken them down. And um, mm -hmm. If Turkey didn't uh, initiate these operations with uh, backing Russia, there wouldn't be offering, there wouldn't be uh, Operation Euphrates Shield areas in northern part. And all these parts, Afrin and, and, and the other uh, Gerablus and, and, and uh, other parts of northern Syria now, home of uh, the, uh, the uh, remaining free Syrian opposition mm -hmm. groups. And, and if, if you see what happened in Dara, and if you, if you just realize that the United States cut its supports to uh, uh, to the opposition. To there. the opposition. Mm -hmm. So it just makes sense that Turkey just made a uh, correct call over there. But of mm -hmm. course, there are like increasing tensions between United uh, between Russia and Turkey, especially about Idlib, and 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 you know Assad is emboldened. Uh, he, he he got the majority of the territory that he wanted to get, and uh, now they're looking to Idlib, especially uh, Latakia. The, mm -hmm. this, you know, certain part of Hatay and that area, because very important for them because of the Alawite uh, population. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to come uh, against Turkey in there. But I don't think uh, it will be that easy for them, because mm -hmm. in Dara and other places, there was no Turkish military uh, presence. Mm -hmm. But in the southern Idlib, there are uh, observation uh, points and camps and uh, military um, headquarters that oversee this ceasefire deal and the, 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 the very fact that there are Turkish army elements in those areas mm -hmm. actually preventing uh, Assad regime and also IRGC linked uh, Iranian groups to come there and they tried as, mm -hmm. as you know they killed some uh, Turkish officials and in return Turkey just unleashed an unprecedented uh, firepower against them and it will continue if they try to do that and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very sure that Turkey wouldn't allow that because 
Turkey is trying to normalize Syria, not the way that maybe Ankara wishes to see, mm -hmm. but at least some sort of a uh, middle way that maybe they can reach. And can and you explain, elaborate a little bit more on this? What is the Ankara view of n basically neutralizing the situation in Syria at this point? I think this is still in the making, so there is not clear cut uh, view and, and also poor and poor over this. I think they will need to see and you know discover in time. But as far as I, I understand, they just want to stabilize Idlib area and northern Syria, and they want to also include Membij in this area. And they just want to create a, a working relationship for the Free Syrian Army and opposition groups that actually they can run, administer, and they can show the world that they actually can operate and govern. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, um, I think this issue with YPG is very important because if Assad regime succeeds to uh, get hold of, of YPG totally, I know we know that they have a very extensive relationship, but if they mm -hmm. just you know leave everything to Assad regime, which actually they uh, negotiate apparently. But the United States is there. So yeah, that's the United be States hard. is there. But Trump administration wants to withdraw from Syria. So mm -hmm. if they withdraw and they don't have a plan for afterwards and if the Assad regime comes back, what happens? I mean, that's a very crucial question. So that's a yeah, long-term question yeah, that that's, Turkey has. Yeah, that's one of the main things because they're trying to, actually somehow they're happy that the United States is withdrawing from uh, Syria because they can target YPG as much as they want. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, their rapid uh, withdrawal from uh, Northeastern Syria also creates this, you know, open area for Assad regime to move in, Iran mm -hmm. to move in and create, you know, long term security threats against Turkey. Mm -hmm. So there must be a middle way for Turkey and the United States to, you know, at least uh, some assurances and some sort of stability that can be provided for this area. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were maybe discussing when this Memmich roadmap, uh, you know, uh, when revealed, revealed uh, they were saying like, you know, why, at least the Turkish foreign minister said, why we don't impose same agreements in majority Arab towns in the northeastern Syria, mm -hmm. like in Raqqa. As you know, Raqqa is very uh, unstable right now because the opposition forces and the, and maybe not opposition forces themselves, but the supporters of the opposition are not happy with, uh, Assad, uh, uh, with uh, YPG. And also there are some part of the population who don't want uh, ISIS, who don't want uh, YPG, but they're sympathetic to Assad. Maybe mm -hmm. they're like small amount of people, but mm -hmm. they still create a lot of problems. So it's very unstable there. So there needs to be another model over there mm -hmm. as they were trying to do in Membich, you know, some part of the opposition, some part of the uh, Raqqa population. So more pro-Turkey opposition groups to control their, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to control Raqqa mm -hmm. since it is more Arab. Yes. Dominated. Yes. Be okay. Because Turkey is working with Arab groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have, of course, Turkoman groups, but they are very small because the Turkomans in Syria are very well, how small. How does Turkey view if uh, other Arab countries are more involved in this? Um, that's the question needs to be answered. For example, there have been reports that Saudi Arabia is planning to do something about mm -hmm. northeastern Syria. Especially there were reports, as you're aware, maybe your viewers are aware too, uh, that uh, Trump administration asked Saudi Arabia to pay some sort of money, mm -hmm. some amount of money to make American yes. Turkey stay. Mm -hmm. I think that's not uh, taken as granted. I think we are not sure if it's going to happen. And, and, and I can tell you this, um, when Saudi Arabia's Gulf minister visited um, northeastern Syria, he first visited Ankara and mm -hmm. then he went to yes. Syria. So there, there is a way to resolve this issue. You know, like this is not like black and white. Mm -hmm. There are like grim. There could be collaboration between yes. Arab nations and Turkey on, yes. on this specific part of Syria. Yes. Um, I want to talk about Idlib a little bit more because this is one of those big questions that there's a lot of worry about what could happen in that region. And, uh, and I have to ask you this because some people blame, for example, that we have Jabhat Tahrir Sham today in Idlib, which is the excuse that Russia keeps trying to hammer. Well, we have them there, you know, while they're, we are very close to Turkey in that area, that Turkey is to blame for having these groups there. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to this? And what is Ankara's plan to, to handle any Assad or Russian threats to Idlib? I mean, um that question has been in Turkish officials' minds how to, you know, resolve this HTS or Nusra or whatever its name, it's all the time changing and they're having the subgroups, it's very hard to follow. Um, the main problem in, in that 
uh, area is that these people also have moderate elements sometimes in there, you know, mm -hmm. because yes. they're mostly creating these umbrella groups and they name themselves after those names, but they're like other uh, moderate elements. And there are like thousands of refugees in the same area where these people are operating, uh, basically uh, finding refuge and millions so, basically from all of Syria exactly. they went there and they're there right yeah and, yeah and for Turkish officers not just the lives of Syrians at stake but also you know any armed confederation that area can result in millions of people try to get inside Turkey and Turkey yes. is already over overwhelmed by more than three million refugees and that's a that's a huge concern it's also not just like uh, it's also political concern, mm -hmm. you know, because if you look at the polls, a lot of people in Turkey, not the majority, are, are, aren't very happy about the Syrian refugees because Turks are also a very nationalistic nation. So um, that's why that's a very hard question, but there were, there were some attempts to resolve it. Uh, first of all, they're trying to create this uh, army of national unity or national army and try mm -hmm. to get all these uh, moderate groups and maybe some elements of these groups that can be considered as moderate into the into that army and, and mm -hmm. try to basically undermine that's one of the uh things that they're trying to do because you know even though they might have this ideological leanings such as mm -hmm. islamism but if, if if turkey is involved turkey can also you know lead them mm -hmm. in some areas and they can prevent them to you know not do some some stuff as far yes. as i understand mm -hmm. and uh that's one of the things that they're trying to do and and secondly that's a that's a long game i mean mm -hmm. if you're trying to make this bloodless if you're trying to make this you know without creating any extensive damage on the refugee population or the turkish security or the syrians living there their security it needs it needs to be like you know in a timetable and it, it has been going on it's mm -hmm. a slow process but i i'm not i'm not sure if they're what they wanted to be that mm -hmm. it still needs to be uh going and the second part of your question about the assad regimes and and russia's threats yes. and um uh i don't think russia is now issuing threats but there are a lot of stories leaked uh, um, on, on media saying that Russia issued threats, but I never seen any confirmation or any mm -hmm. hints that Russia is actually threatening Turkey. I'm very sure they're negotiating. And um, I mean, look, if Russia wants to do something Idlib, as I said, they need to get through Turkish military outposts over mm -hmm. there. And, um, and also, secondly, if let's say there is a collapse of this so-called ceasefire regime, Turkey can also provide arms and ammunition and other support to these opposition groups and the war can start again. Yeah. And that's, that's not a very good scenario, not for Assad regime, not for Russia, you know, mm -hmm. like because in Dera they had like open hand, they just, you know, open area, like a lot of people. Nobody defended or, yeah. or supported the opposition. Yes. And, uh -huh. and the opposition decided to sign these agreements for, you know, they stay there as like a local police and allowing the, you know, Assad regime to at least put their flags in the government institutes, but not maybe deploying their soldiers. So um, in northern part, a lot of people who didn't sign those agreements, they were moved to northern yes. Syria. So. These people can be supported. These people mm -hmm. can take, you know, they already have arms, but they and can. And they're moderates. Yeah, and they're mm -hmm. moderates, and they can also initiate the war. I don't think Turkey wants that. Mm -hmm. But if you, you know, threat them, and if you just, you know, don't leave them any other option, Turkey needs to do something about it because mm -hmm. they just want to stabilize and they just want to use it as a kind of kind of a buffer zone as well. I mm -hmm. mean, look, uh, you have that area. You have the northern area. You have Membic. If you have stabilized these areas, it also prevents people, you know, getting into to Turkey and also prevents, you know, maybe violent groups or, you know, the terror groups, is, you know, infiltrate in Turkey. So it's a very beneficial uh, deal for opposition and Turkey as well. Mm -hmm. Is there any military plans for Turkey to go to the eastern part of the Euphrates and do something about the already existing uh, SDF forces with the protection of the United States? I think it all depends on um, Membic agreement, you know, um, if you remember Turkey had this, you know, uh, steamy, hot of rhetoric against uh, the uh, YPG president Membic, basically saying that, you know, we can target YPG and then in the meantime, by mistake or coincidence, then American, you know, officers staying there can be, you know, uh, mm -hmm. harmed or like that was a rhetoric that worked against the United States and the United States decided to pursue more consultatory approach because they were very concerned that actually Turkish uh, military and American military can come to each other's, you know, uh, they basically can uh, uh, step on each other that they didn't want to happen. And 
I think Mem Beach roadmap, it, it works perfectly. Mm -hmm. I don't think we won't see any immediate uh, military incursions in the uh, northeastern Syria. But if that, um, you know, plan doesn't work or uh, if they still fake it because the United States have been faking this issue for a while, like, you know, oh, it's not PKK, it's YPG. Oh, it's not YPG, it's STF. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not STF, it's Membridge Military Council. Oh, it's not Membridge Military Council, it's a civilian council. You know, there are a lot mm -hmm. of names going on over there. So then you could see some sort of uh, angry Erdogan, you know, mm -hmm. especially emboldened by five years term with the elections, you know, feeling mm -hmm. more secure, can do some uh, unexpected moves in northern Syria. But it's mm -hmm. very early to speculate this kind of stuff. But in the, in the same time, um, you know, this deal with the United States and United States uh, basically preventing YPG to do anything against Turkey from the southern borders. Mm -hmm. It has been very silent for the last uh, couple months, almost maybe up to one year. There mm -hmm. is nothing going on over there. So this has been very beneficial for Turkey. So they're just, you know, waiting, bidding their time to see what will happen next. Mm -hmm. In terms of Assad, there was a lot of speculations about a changing position of Turkey towards Assad. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what are the limitations to this? And what could Turkey accept as a final solution for Syria? Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of Assad staying in power or even being allowed to so-called rerun for elections, mm -hmm. uh, which he never did before, but what do you think we could see I can as give, the official position? I mean, if you speak with the Turkish officials, they would just tell you that, you know, look at Egypt. I mean, Turkey and Egypt basically had a very bad relationship since uh, 2013's coup. Mm -hmm. And since then, Sisi ran um, an election, you know, he, he basically has been president for the last five years. And with all those benefits can come out of it, Erdogan still doesn't talk to CC and mm -hmm. CC didn't kill hundreds of thousands of people and you know didn't create millions of refugees and didn't allow you know uh, Daesh's rise and creation mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, Erdogan and Assad I don't think in any case they would come to near each other and they would even speak to each other especially mm -hmm. if Erdogan you know stays in power uh, until the you know the next election if he wins mm -hmm. you can extend the time up to 10 years if Assad's yes. around. But for Turkey, there are like a lot of different alternatives can work out. Um, they, they, I think they are aware of the fact that Assad is not going anywhere. But they, they, they maybe trust Russia to uh, basically pressure Assad regime to uh, create this uh, kind of a living space for the Syrian opposition in Syria. And somehow um, Syrian opposition or the Syrian opposition supporters uh, to have a saying in the country. I think that will be very delicate to resolve. Um, as you know, Assad regime is a very totalitarian uh, regime and, and they, they have a habit to uh, have a long uh, game and not basically, uh, you know, they're not upholding their promises at all. I know that, but they also have a long game. I mean, mm -hmm. you, ca you can see that they're having a working relationship with the Syrian opposition groups for a while and then, mm -hmm. you know, after a year or two, you'll just see that they arrest them. They, you know, mm -hmm. it's very uh, slippery slope. But for them, there must be a third way. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe Assad staying a couple of years and mm -hmm. living to someone else, or mm -hmm. you know, this kind of like lot of there are a lot of speculations over there. So there's no yes. clear cut uh, thing. But yeah. they they Policy. essentially they want Assad to go because mm -hmm. they cannot normalize relationship with Syria as, as long, long as, as he's Assad in is power. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about Iran? Because also we know that there's some connection between the Turkish government and the Iranian mm -hmm. regime. Now there's sanctions against Iran. There's a lot mm -hmm. of international pressure against Iran. Mm -hmm. What is the Turkish position on all of this? Turkey doesn't trust Iran at all. Mm -hmm. They're very distrustful of Iran. But uh, they recognize that Iran has been a power in the region that since the late Ottoman times, uh, they didn't go... Uh, against each other with military means or mm -hmm. with violence. They try to resolve their differences with, you know, in the, like, basically on, they're just, you know, putting a lot of things under the carpet. Mm -hmm. Let's put it in this way. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of these proxy pressures mm -hmm. against each other, but they never came to uh, directly, you know, targeting each other or basically imposing a policy that, you know, can create uh, un substantial, substantial damage to each other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for Turkey, Iran is an energy source, mm -hmm. and it's a very important trading partner. 
and uh, the, the Iranian sanctions can harm Turkish economy in terms of the energy needs and especially if we think about the Turkish economy's need for uh, you know uh, exports and, and, and the need for bilateral trade especially uh, if, you, if you consider the uh, uh, the, the current um, stagnation and the problems with the Turkish economy just imposing the sanctions is also creating great harm to Turkish exporters and the Turkish economy so for Turkish officials it's not just like you know Iranian you know nuclear program or Iranians you know ambition in the region or they're supporting you know groups in Syria or in Iraq or destabilizing Middle East but it, it, it hurts their constituency Mm -hmm. You know, that there's a direct link between uh, Turkish exporters, businessmen who are supporting the ruling party and, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, but in the same time, they're having a very hard relationship and this, you know, this trust relationship with Iran. So, I think they will try to negotiate with United States some sort of a way out in this. Mm -hmm. Maybe like substantially decreasing the interaction and the, uh, uh, the, the, the trade with Iran and try to... Uh, stick up with the uh, Iranian sanctions, but also try to have this kind of relationship with some sort of trade relationship with Iran, even though, but mm -hmm. I don't think... To try to find a middle ground where yes, they can still think, trade, but not completely yes. the way it used to be. Yes, but I don't think American officials are really willing to do that. They're mm -hmm. like, uh, as far as I understand from their statements, they're like, no, we don't do that, but they're still trying. And it can create some problems on top of all this problematic relationship. But in terms of the region, of course, Turkish officials are really, really bothered by the fact that Iran is in Syria. Mm -hmm. and, um, but eventually they recognize that they cannot kick Iran out of Syria. I mean, come on, Israel couldn't do it. United but States Israel couldn't. is planning on doing it. What but is the Turkish position on that? Israel's, um, they're bidding, they're betting, sorry, they're betting on Russia. And if you look at Russian officials speaking on the record, on the background, they can, they just say that they cannot do it. because Well, they're betting on Russia not doing anything about them by bombing the uh, Iranian military bases. Yeah, they're doing it. They've been bombarding the same base like at least 10 times now. Apparently mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't work very well. I mean, I understand Israel's point of view and I think Turkish officials have no quarrels with it. They mm -hmm. just, you know, they just silently watching it and probably mm -hmm. having a very good time. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, they're there and they're not just in the southern Syria, they're like in the north, in, yes. you know, in Damascus, in Aleppo, they're even in Latakia, you know, they're everywhere. So it's very hard to kick them outside of Syria. I mean, mm -hmm. it would require substantial efforts by a couple of powers to take them out of mm -hmm. Syria. And I, I think Turkish officials also recognize that, you know, they're unhappy about it. They can uh, basically disrupt Iranian efforts in Syria, but they cannot kick them out of Syria. They mm -hmm. don't have the means. Mm -hmm. And so this is why with Iran and, and Russia, they were collaborating with the ceasefire regime. And I think also for Turkish officials, it seemed like, you know, you know Iran wasn't also keeping its promises about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this the escalation zones because it was IRGC link groups targeting Turkish officials, basically to killing Turkish soldiers. Mm -hmm. and, and in Iraq, um, I think in Iraq, Turkey and the United States almost looking at each other. Uh, eye to eye, you know, like having the agreement on uh, Abadi's uh, uh, situation, like Abadi as a Shiite leader and close to the United States and also having ties with the Iran, some sort of a, you know, middle mm -hmm. way person that can also provide this kind of stability. Mm -hmm. I think Turkey is sticking with that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, when and um, Sadr, what about Sadr? Sadr, um, an interesting <laughs> fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, even though uh, he had this couple of demonstrations in ba Baghdad when mm -hmm. uh, Turkey uh, intervened in um, northern Iraq with military operations, he protested them, but whenever Ankara called him to meet to Ankara, he just, you know, went to Ankara, had these meetings, you know, he all the time had an mm -hmm. open uh, channels with Turkish officials, and yes. when he has won the elections, Erdogan called him, and, you know, that was a very... Congratulated him. Congratulated mm -hmm. him. So, I think Turkey doesn't think that Sadr is part of the Iranian, you know, uh, yes. front over there mm -hmm. and also, uh, you know, uh, betting on Sadr as well. But as I said, Iraq is more of like the United States and Turkey are likely to uh, To agree on, on yes. everything almost. Yeah. Um, what about the European Union? Mm -hmm. We know that also the Turkish-European relationship hasn't been its best lately. Um, what is the, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of Turks who live in Germany, for example. Why are we seeing the deterioration of relationship between Turkey and Germany, as one example? I mean, um, 
all those Turks living in Germany, they also have different political allegiances in Turkey. And uh, the Turkish president coming to uh, Germany and making campaigns during the election periods uh, also create this kind of uh, social troubles for Germany, at least according to German officials. They mm -hmm. just say, you know, like uh, this create uh, disharmony, this create uh, disagreements and, and fights uh, within the Turkish community, which eventually harm or integration with the Turkish community as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also there is this, you know, a lot of things are going on in Europe, as you know, like xenophobia, you know, racism is rampant in Germany. Mm -hmm. There is a right wing, uh, rise of right wing politics through the Europe and uh, in, in, in Germany especially. So if you put all of these things together and look at the issue from that perspective, you understand that why German officials are very uh, bothered by the fact that Erdogan was in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. But I think that wasn't one of the main issues. The, the main issue was... Um, the fact that Turkey was also arresting some German uh, citizens and um, there was also the state of emergency in Turkey that the, the German officials were like trying to punish Turkey because, you know, they're also constituency and, and um, there is this rampant anti-Turkish point mm -hmm. of view in the German, German public. So they Do were trying think to... That this populist, uh, you know, movements in in uh, Europe mm -hmm. is actually behind this deterioration of relationship, where they're, you know, more inter, you know, kind of wanted to focus on themselves, isolationist, mm -hmm. uh, more right wing, mm -hmm. uh, religious, Christian, so on and so forth. I think I agree with that, especially after the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe, and uh, it started with the Syrian refugee crisis that you know continued. And there's, as you suggested, this populist right-wing uh, politics is just a trend in all Europe. And it also, of course, had a huge impact on uh, Turkish-European Union relationship because, you know, Turkey in their eyes is a Muslim country. European Union is a Christian Jewish heritage, uh, uh, you know. So, like, a Muslim member getting inside the European Union has been an issue, but mm -hmm. it has become more crucial because the European Union was, you know, determining itself as a secular entity. Mm -hmm. But since with this rise of, you know, uh, right-wing populist agenda, now it's more and more uh, determining itself with the national identity mm -hmm. and coming along with that, the, the Christian or the Jewish identity. So mm -hmm. um, that's one of the main reasons as well. But, you know, Turkey and, United, Turkey and the European Union, they're not going to divorce anytime soon because if you look at Turkey's trade, um, 90 percent 80 to 90 percent of the trade is between european union and turkey and both mm -hmm. import and export mm -hmm. and i'm exaggerating it's mostly sometimes 70 but sometimes it gets to 80 and 90 in some mm -hmm. months um so you cannot cut yourself out of european union when you have this substantial trade ties like both your import and export not just one of them mm -hmm. and turkey is part of uh, uh the uh custom union with the european union it provides some uh, huge advantages in terms of the trade and the custom union agreement somehow is attached to the European Union membership as well. And also for the European Union, the, the, the Syrian refugee crisis showed that without Turkey, they cannot uh, secure their borders. Mm -hmm. And um, they also having a very hard time to create a national uh, defense strategy and, and, and a national army for European Union to provide security and safety. And, and Turkey is one of the regional powers that can also part of that security structure that they want to have also include. Mm -hmm. And Turkey is a NATO member, which essentially makes it very likely to work along with the European Union nations systematically, not mm -hmm. just just one time to time. So for all those reasons, I just can't tell you that this issue between European Union and Turkey has just become some sort of political ploy. Mm -hmm. And if you aware of the fact that uh, German uh, state invited President Erdogan for a state visit uh, in September, mm -hmm. so that there will be an official visit. So uh, and, and recently there is the rapprochement with the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. and um, the, the growing burgeoning ties with France and even though you... So it is also a fluctuation in yeah, the relationship that is up it. and down. So it's, it's actually getting better. Yeah, it's very getting better with mm -hmm. the European Union countries. Is there still potential for Turkey to become part of the European Union? I mean, there's a potential, but if you look at it with a realistic view, I don't think it will happen anytime soon mm -hmm. uh, because... It's, just, it's, it's not just uh, maybe Turkey is failing in some criteria, but the European Union countries, they're not having this, you know, uh, ambition or, you know, they had this agenda, like having a Muslim country in the European Union, and they were, like, proud of the idea that, you know, Muslim countries part of the European Union as, mm -hmm. like, a very progressive and substantially yes. important thing. 
But as you said, all these changes in European Union, you know, domestic politics and United Kingdom leaving the European Union, which was very big supporter of Turkey's membership, mm -hmm. uh, the the political uh, spectrum, you know, changed a lot in, mm -hmm. in the European Union. So, uh, so the whole European Union is now shaken. Yes. So it's not about bringing Turkey, yeah, yeah. yes new uh, partners and new countries in there. My last topic I want to focus on here is the fears of a lot of people talking in Washington about the worries about you know human rights in mm -hmm. Turkey, the rights of the free press, mm -hmm. and the arrests that happened to mm -hmm. you know I, I, many people who are from the judicial system, mm -hmm. from uh, government uh, positions, and uh, you know just to people employees basically. Can you tell me about this as a journalist? You're yeah. not working, you don't work for the government, you're an independent journalist mm -hmm. who works for an independent, mm -hmm. uh, basically, a newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me your perspective. I want to hear the Turkish perspective on these talks that are going on in Washington and obviously elsewhere and the, the yeah. West in general. I mean, let's be honest, Turkish government, not just this government, the previous governments, they never had a proper record of freedom of press in Turkey. So it has been all the time very hard topic and government pressure over newspapers and journalists have been some sort of a realistic thing that you would just keep in your mind when you write down something. So mm -hmm. this is nothing new. But after the coup attempt and the trauma it created in the Turkish, uh, you know, people mm -hmm. and the government, I mean, look at the issue from Erdogan's point of view and the Turkish officials point of view, they were just about the kill that night and that struck uh, some sort of uh, uh, a tone in Turkish government officials that they started to uh, see everything very suspiciously and they they decided to take you know utmost precaution against everything and with the state of emergency and the, 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 you know when you impose a state of emergency they suspend some sort of rights mm -hmm. and and you increase the judicial powers and the police and prosecutors powers a lot of people put in prison and they didn't have chance to get in front of a judge and, and that there were some uh, constitutional court decisions and it, it, it took some time to uh, apply them. But now state of emergency expired mm -hmm. and there have been some uh, journalists, uh, high level names released from the prison because mm -hmm. now courts are working. Now mm -hmm. the state of emergency ended so courts are, uh, you know, can take care of these matters in their hands and then the judicial system can work its own, its, with its own accords. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, but the, the, the issue with the freedom of press, I think uh, it will take time mm -hmm. uh, to repair in Turkey fully. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a good sign that there are some journals that are now getting released. And, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, there are also uh, other trials that are uh, coming days that might probably provide more releases as well. And uh, we have to be hopeful. I mean, otherwise, how can we, how can mm -hmm. we do our job? Um, I want to thank you so much, Reggie, for giving us the time today. I think that's our time for today, but I'd love to have you again in the future. Thank you. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.